anointing, laying of hands on them. Acts 433 Church, bringing the gospel. All right, so for week seven, we're going to go old school with some Old Testament verses. It's great to be with you all finally this morning. Uh, the Old Testament verses are going to be found in actually two chapters. We're going to kind of bounce around there. 1 Samuel chapter 13 and 1 Samuel chapter 14 as well. What I love about this text is it's so practical for our everyday lives. Uh, it has an answer to a question, what should we do when we're faced with overwhelming odds? Now, there's going to be seasons in our lives where we feel like things are stacked up against us. We feel like, man, I don't even know what to do. Things are coming against me. I can't even handle this. This is just bigger than me. So without further ado, we're going to put the first verse on the screen for our viewing audience. It says, as a header, subheader there, Israel without weapons. Uh, Saul and his son, uh, Jonathan, and the men with them were staying in Gibeah, uh, Benjamin, in, in Gibeah and Benjamin while the Philistines camped at Michmash. Without knowing anything of what's going on in the story, the subheader lets you know that Israel is without weapons. And it should tell you that they are not at a position of personal strength. And that is a good place to be, actually. Uh, where we are at a place uh, where we have to rely on God's grace. Because the Word of God says that God's grace is sufficient for us. For His power is perfected in weakness. When we are weak, then we are, in fact, very strong. It's because we have to rely on His strength, not ours. And of course, God's strength is so much more stronger than anything we bring to the table. So when we're at a place and we go, man, this is bigger than me, that is a great place to be because then we can see God's miraculous strength applied to our situation. Uh, we have enemies that wage war with us every day. Now, I'm not talking about the Philistines, but I am talking about enemies like the enemy of... Uh, anxiety, the enemy of fear, the enemy of greed, of loneliness, of depression, etc., etc. These different enemies attack us all the time. And we can be like Israel, where we feel that we are ill-equipped to fight this battle that just wages against us day after day, week after week. But we have been called to victory over that thing that is coming against us. We have actually been equipped for victory in Jesus' name as we use the spiritual weapons that we have been given. Now that's a little clue because the sermon title is called Only One Sword is Needed. And all the warriors gathered in this room and tuning in around the world said amen or Hoorah! If I can get uh, hoorah in here this morning. We are equipped for victory. Uh, we have been given the weapons we need to fight against those things, those enemies. The enemy of uh, anxiety, of fear, of loneliness, of depression, of whatever it is. It says Saul and his son uh, have united their small forces and have entrenched themselves at Gaba. And the text tells us this in verse 16. And we have to ask, well, what led them to this place where they're entrenched and, and, and all of this stuff is happening around them? Well, I'm going to try to cover it in two quick minutes. Uh, it said in the text earlier in the chapter, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, that there is 3,000 uh, warriors that Saul has. He says, I'm going to take 2,000 with me. I'm going to give 1,000 to my son Jonathan. And you would think that the guy that's got double the numbers is going to be the one that's going to attack the enemy, right? Well, that's not how it plays out. It's not Saul with the 2,000 who attacks his Philistine garrison. It is Jonathan who goes forth and attacks them and is successful. And we get to this place, and it's remarkable because you, you find out that they didn't have any weapons, and yet he attacks a garrison, and he is successful. Uh, the text tells us that none of the soldiers carried swords or spears with them. They had to rely on axes, sickles, mattocks, and plow points as their weapons. Not a great, uh, well-equipped army. You ever hear the expression of, don't poke the sleeping bear? You ever heard that? Well, maybe it came from this text. 
because he attacks this garrison, and uh, what happens is the whole Philistine army is alerted. So it's like, uh-oh, we're in trouble now. Now, if you're wondering, we talked about 3,000 3, uh, soldiers that uh, the Israelites have. Now, the Philistine army has an estimate of about 40,000 men, 6,000 horsemen, 3,000 special units. They are all equipped, and they are ready to fight. Uh, so what does Saul do after they have this little victory over a garrison? The text says in verse 3 that Saul braggingly uh, sounds a trumpet, letting all Israel know that we are victorious. So all Israel, verse 4, heard the news that Saul had attacked the Philistine garrison. Wait a minute. That doesn't sound like what went down. That sounds a little different than what really happened. I thought that Jonathan was the one that attacked the, uh, the, the Philistines. In verse 3, he is. So what we have here is we have Saul taking credit for Jonathan's bold attack on the garrison of the Philistines. And we see the character of Saul being revealed. He has such insecurity in his life that he will not allow anyone, none of his associates, not even his own son, to receive credit for what they did. In fact, it's not really Jonathan's uh, victory. It was the Lord who was working on Jonathan's heart, and so the victory was the Lord's. But the point is, Saul is the one who says, Man, look at what I did. I'm blowing the trumpet. I was successful at attacking the enemy. Verse 3 tells us the Philistines find out about it. They're so happy that they were attacked. They're like, let's bake him a cake. Let's invite him over. Let's talk this out. Let's have some tea and uh, crumpets and, and really just uh, get along with each other. No, they're, they're mad as hornets. And... The soldiers, the Bible tells us, are as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Oh my goodness. Not good. Not good. We don't know the exact number. I got 40,000 as a conservative number from uh, our, the first century uh, historian, uh, Josephus, who would write about this. Uh, but there's a lot. We don't know the exact number, but there's a lot. In verse 6, it says, When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical... Yes, and the army was hard pressed. They hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and the pits and the cisterns. Now, there's a good battle strategy when you're outnumbered and they're coming after you because you attacked them. Let's just hide out. Um, some Hebrews, it says, went as far as to cross the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. And here they are. Bye. See ya. I'm out of here. I am not sticking around to see how this thing turns out. So we, we have a, a, a visual of, man, I'm going as far away from them as I possibly can get because I'm trying to save my own neck. Uh, so they had 3,000 to begin with, but a bunch left. So their numbers have gotten even smaller, considerably smaller. Um, and so that is where we're at, starting at verse 17. I'm going to put that up for you. It puts us right back to where we left off in the story. So raiding parties went from the Philistine camp in three detachments. One turned towards Ophrah in the vicinity of Shual. Another towards uh, Beth Horan. And the third toward the borderland overlooking the valley of Sabohim facing the wilderness. Uh, so Saul is not daring. He was not the one that attacked the Philistines. He's hiding out in the caves. Uh, and it says that he's got only 600 men who have not abandoned him at this point. So the army has shrunk down in side, size. They are The ones that are left are scared to death. They're just thinking that the best strategy I have is not even to try to get out of town, but to just hunker down and hide and not let them find me. And the reason I, I point all this out is if you know the history of Israel, they had a king. They had the king of kings. And they looked at all the nations around them and what they had, and they said, you know what we need is we need an earthly king. And here is the earthly king of little use to them. And he's left 
His people vulnerable. The raiding parties are coming and marching into their lands with no army to stop them, to take, to plunder and pillage and, and to take their women and to do whatever they want to do. And Saul is going to just, well, it's too bad. I'm going to save myself. I'm going to hide out in the cave. So this is what he's left his people to. King Dumbo, who took the credit for God's victory, is hiding out, unwilling to face his enemy. I have to say, and maybe this scripture is, I mean, it's always so important, but in the time that we live in now, it just rings so true. Whenever we put our trust in a man or a woman, a government, we're going to be disappointed at some point. Trust in God. You'll see what happens when a person is willing to trust in God during a dire situation. Because when we trust in God, what will happen is we'll be led to overwhelming victory. The situation gets worse. In verse 19, it says they couldn't even find a blacksmith to try to give them a fighting chance to fashion some swords for them. Couldn't find a, a blacksmith in the whole land of Israel, verse 19, because the Philistines were smart enough to say, if they make swords and spears, we might be in some trouble. So the Philistines think they're good. We way outnumber them. They don't have the weapons they need. But i got to tell you that the sword that we use to fight is not a physical sword. It is, in fact, the very Word of God. Ephesians 6.17 says that God's Word is a sword that will cut away the bondages that we have in our lives. We have an example of what Jesus did. He's in the wilderness. He's being tempted by Satan. And He gives us a pattern of how we are to fight against the enemy. What Jesus did is He used the written Word of God. He said to the devil, It is written! And He used that spiritual sword, the Word of God, and it just cut through that temptation. See, Jonathan recognizes that the Philistines are the enemies of God's people. And he knows what God had promised. He knows what God's Word is. That God will fight for His people. What could stop us from an amazing victory when all of the odds are stacked against us. When God has promised something, He is going to deliver. So it says all, verse 20, all Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plow points, mattocks, axe, and sickles sharpened. The price was two-thirds of a shekel for sharpening plow points and mattocks and a third of a shekel for sharpening uh, forks and axes. We're going to use whatever they've got. But they don't need any of that stuff. We're going to see something remarkable take place. Verse 22. On the day of the battle, not a soldier that was with uh, Jonathan or Saul had a sword. None of them. Except for Saul and his son Jonathan had one. One each. One sword. So it looked bleak. The lands are being raided. They are suffering the consequences of attacking an enemy that's stronger than them. And I really believe it was because Saul stole God's glory, tried to steal God's glory. He's not going to be successful because God's going to receive the glory through the story. We'll see it. But he tried to rob God of His glory and so they're suffering the consequences of it. What I can tell you is we might not, we're not able to change our past, but we can allow our past to ruin our future. And the best way to not do that is to live in the moment, to live in the present. Because you've got, you got to understand that we won't live in fear and worry in the moment. And you might say, well, that seems like I'm pretty fearful in the moment, Pastor Matt. And it's impossible. And now you might go, well, I'm really confused now. I really feel afraid, and I feel fearful, and I feel a lot of worry in the moment. Impossible. 
fear and worry have to do with your future? That's projecting and living to what may happen, what could happen, if. And condemnation and regret are living in our past. You see, when we live in the moment, and when we're present in our moment, that is where we're going to see the victory be manifested in our lives. You see, God gave the children of Israel manna in the wilderness one day at a time. The reason for it is that if they kept the manna until the next day, it'd become rotten and breed worms. You see, God's grace is given to us on a day-by-day -day basis, and it gives us victory in our present. So we need to focus on today. We need to focus on the moment. Don't get caught up in our past, the mistakes of our past, and don't project to our future, which can breed worry and anxiety and fear. Receive God's grace for your victory today. That's why God's Word says, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So Jonathan attacks the Philistines. He's living in the moment. He knows what God's promise to his people is. In verse 30, 23, it says, Now a detachment of the Philistines had gone out to the pass at Michmash. One day... Oh, there's the bonus slide. God's word is a sword that cuts away. You don't, you don't have that in your notes, but I'll put that up there anyways. That's good to reinforce that again. God's word is that sword that cuts away the bondage in our lives. During that temptation in the wilderness, it was Jesus who used the written word uh, as, as a way to fight against the devil. Oh, I have this note. You guys have this note. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Here we go. I got ahead of myself. Fear and worry have to do with your future. That's why when you know, see, it's amazing. When you go start to feel like, man, I'm feeling really anxious. I'm feeling really worried. I'm very nervous. It should be a trigger in our mind to go, well, wait, hold on a minute. That must mean that I'm, I'm projecting forward to my, my future. And if you're feeling condemnation, we know there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He's taken our guilt and our shame. That's meaning we're thinking back to our past before we were in Christ, or we're not recognizing that we were in Christ when we made that mistake, and He's already removed it. He's already forgotten about it. We don't have to remind God about what He's already uh, uh, forgiven us from. from. God's grace is given to us day by day on a daily basis, and it gives us victory in our present. So, moving forward, what Jonathan does in verse 1 in chapter 14, is it says that he said, Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And that's one of the smartest things he could have done. He didn't tell the one who tried to steal the credit for the Lord's victory. He didn't tell the one who will offer up an offering to God uh, that something only the priest could do because he couldn't wait for an answer from the Lord. He needed to know now. He didn't ask the one whose rule is over. He says, I'm going to take a step of faith and I'm going to move forward believing that what God has promised He will deliver. I'm not even going to mention to the king what I'm going to do because it's not going to go good. He's going to try to talk me out of it or he's going to try to come up with some game plan that's nonsense and it's not going to work. Verse 2, it says, Saul's staying on the outskirts. He's underneath the pomegranate tree in Migron. With him, about 600 men. Uh, verse 3, among him, who is Ahiah, who is wearing an aphod, his son, I uh, son of Ichabod's brother, Ahitu, I love this, I'm going to work out these names, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. What I have to tell you is in this verse, we see a scene that is a religious sham. You've got... You've got the king hanging out under a pomegranate tree and a guy dressed like a priest who has no business wearing the garb that he's wearing. 
religion, religiosity on the outside, and we've got someone with dynamic living faith on the inside, Jonathan, who's actually going forward by faith and is going to see the victory that God has already promised his people. Um, and so on verse 4, this, is, this speaks to me. On verse 4, it says, On each side of the pass, remember, I'm talking about overwhelming odds, overwhelming odds in our lives, when things are stacked up against us. On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach where the Philistine outpost is, there is a cliff. One is called Boats Ats, Boats Ates, while glistening, it means white and glistening, and other, Sine Thorny. One cliff stood toward the north to Michmash, the other to the south, a sharp crag, and another sharp crag. And so, in order to receive victory, victory is going to be found between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> Told you, it's overwhelming odds. You what do you think that they're camped out on the beach and it's like all nice? He's got a mountain, a rocky crag on either side. I mean, they're fortified. They're in there. They're in a position of strength. Victory is found between a rock and a hard place. Jonathan says in verse 6 to his young arm bearer, Come, let us go over the outposts of these uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Now here's something that I want to be very clear on. Back then in the Old Testament, they did not know. They had the promises of God. But the covenant that was made was between God and His people. So when His people screwed up, there was things. There was curses. There was things that would happen uh, to them. And so this wasn't a, a for sure thing. Even though God said that He would deliver and He would, he would lead His people to victory, that He had promised this land to them, etc., etc., it doesn't mean that, that invading armies wouldn't come and conquer them and they would go to slavery and other things would happen. Because the covenant was fashioned between them and God, and when they would sin, uh, there was consequences, and sometimes that happened. So He's going, you know, I don't know if God's going to act on our behalf. Perhaps. But in the day that we live in, under the new covenant, where the blood of Christ is applied to your life and to my life, uh, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We don't have to wonder, is God going to act on my behalf? Is God going to act according to uh, my best interest? Of course He is. The question is, are you going to believe Him at His word and take that step forward by faith? That's the question. So we don't have to put the perhaps. By faith we can say, the Lord is acting on my behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Verse 7 says, do all that you have in your mind, his arm bearer said. Go ahead, I'm with you, heart and soul. Now one of the things that people do get tripped up with is uh, this word, uncircumcised men, where... Uh, you know, why would God do this? Why would God do that? Uh, what does that mean? What is that referencing this, these Philistines, these uncircumcised men? Uh, it it's really uh, gives a picture of those who don't have God. So don't think that you are like the world. You are a child of God. You are not like the world. The Lord is Yahweh. And Yahweh means the covenant-keeping God. It speaks of this covenant of grace that we have. And Yahweh, Jesus, who would come in the flesh many, many years later, uh, His name Jesus means the Lord saves. There is salvation found in Christ. Perhaps the covenant-keeping God will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord. No, it doesn't matter what the odds are. Nothing can hinder the Lord. Jesus doesn't just save us from hell. He saves us every day. Every day. We have the Lord with us. We have the same Holy Spirit that lives in our hearts that came upon Jonathan in that moment and it testifies to the truth that no 40,000 plus Philistine army or anything else in this world, can hinder the Lord from saving. 
Because we have Jesus, the Lord, who saves with us. My main point is this. When the odds are stacked against us, we only need one sword. Jonathan only had one sword. We don't need a physical sword. I don't care how sharp it is. When you're up against 40,000 plus, and you've got a physical sword. Good luck to you. Um, in fact, we're going to see a funny, kind of a comical thing where people could go and read it wrong and go, man, Jonathan's a warrior. Look at what he did. It's nothing about that. We only need one sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What Jonathan needed was faith to move forward into battle. Faith comes by the Word of God. That's the sword he needed. He needed the promise that God made him. To put more stock in what God said than what he saw all around him. Boldness to act is not mustering up courage. Boldness to act comes by hearing the Word of God, and that is what faith is. Nothing can hinder us from saving, whether by many or by few. So Jonathan says, come on, we'll cross over to them, and we're going to let them see us. I love these, these true accounts of just ridiculousness of a, of a plan, of an idea. Well, we're going to go over there, and we're going to let them see us. And if they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up, because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. So I wonder what the arm bearer is, is hoping for. I wonder. I wonder if he's going, man, I hope they say, come on up, so that we can fight all of them. Or I wonder if he's kind of secretly hoping, like, ah, oh, man, I hope that they just come down to us and we can just talk and, you know, whatever, you know, not, not get involved. But he's ready to do whatever the Lord leads. So both of them show themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines. The Hebrews are crawling out of their holes like the vermin they are, like the worms they are. They're hiding in caves. Here they are crawling out to us. Men of the outpost shouted at Jonathan, and there's probably some other choice words that the Bible doesn't include of what they're shouting out to them. And his arm bearer, come up to us and we're going to teach you a lesson. We have something to show you. So Jonathan said to his arm bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Jonathan climbs up using his hands and feet. So his hands and feet climbing, crawling. His arm bearer is right behind him. And just a historical lesson, you're not feeling overly confident with an arm bearer. There's a reason they're an arm bearer. It's not like they're like uh, the next American warrior, gladiator. Like The arm bearer is not the the rock that you've got next to you, the greatest ninja. Philistines fell before Jonathan and his arm bearer followed and killed behind him. In the first attack, now this is where if we don't read this right, see, I don't want to get into Saul's shoes where we start going, man, I'm so glad he had Jonathan. Man, he a guy wiped out the Philistines. No, this is what the Lord's going to do. It says, in the first attack, Jonathan and his arm bearer killed some 20 men in an area about half an acre. Again, it's not about Jonathan's strength. I mean, woohoo, 20 men are gone. How many are left? Let's see, 20 minus 40,000 plus, let's just call it an even 40,000 left to go. He did good in half an acre, but the troops are coming and you're in trouble. They'd be wiped out if the Lord wasn't with them. But 1 Corinthians 3.16 tells us that you and I, we're the majority. We're not the minority. We're the majority because God is with us. God is still with the church today. It says in verse 15, this is why this is the Lord. Panic struck the whole army. Panic doesn't strike an army when they've got 40,000 plus and 20 men die. Are you kidding? Like, that's not panic. Like, that's like, oh, well, we get more food for us. I mean, who cares? 20? I mean, 20 could die from diarrhea back then. Like, seriously. It's not, like, you could get an infection. 20 probably died from shaving uh, that, that afternoon. I mean, 20 is nothing. 
Panic strikes the whole army, those in the camp and field, and the outposts and the raiding parties, and the ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. And the writer wants us to know that victory is not Jonathan's victory, but victory belonged to the Lord because He is the one that caused the earth to shake. He is the one that caused the panic and caused the enemies to be scattered. The good news for us is that we go in victory as we go in Jesus' name because He has already defeated our enemies. The ground shook. When Jesus was on the cross and He died for our sins and He was uh, resurrected and everything changed, the enemy was defeated. And that's why the Bible says that we are more than conquerors. We don't just survive the battle. A more than conqueror actually gains from what came against them. Oh, you're going to come against me? I've got God with me. So whatever the enemy formed against us will not only not prosper, but it will prosper us. Because those we are going to be the ones that as more than conquerors actually come out ahead of the game because of what came against us. So go ahead and bring it. I'm living in the moment. I'm claiming the very promises that God made as my secure, uh, secure foundation that I have in Jesus Christ. The Bible says we're more than conquerors, so walk as you truly are. Walk as champions. I, I've seen this before in sports uh, groups, and I love it. Do you guys remember when the Cubs finally won the World Series? They said it was impossible. They said it will never, it's like the Lions, you know, the curse of Bobby Lane. They had the curse of a goat or something, I think, it was Wrigley Field. And they finally won. And it was bizarre because I knew, I actually have a friend from Chicago, and he was always, he had this like, it's like the Lions defeated demeanor. I mean, it's changing though. I love that. It's changing here. Um, but it was like, it's like, oh, we, nothing good will ever come to the Cubbies. Like, oh, woe is me. And then they win. And it's like, well, how do we act? Like the city didn't even know how. We're, we're champions. What is this? We're champions. And so when this realization hit them, it was like, this is nice. So this is what it's like to be a Cardinals fan. So this is what it's like, you know, to be a champion. So when we get it, when you understand you have the victory, we are champions. He's defeated our enemies. When we come up against overwhelming odds, it's not a perhaps God will act. God acted on our behalf. As we speak the word of God over our situation, we're going to see overwhelming victory. There's only one sword that you need. It's the word of God. So slay those enemies. Watch them tremble and fear as you speak God's promises over your situation. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you that even though there's persecution around the world today, churches uh, and Christians are, 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 are being killed for their faith, are being tortured and imprisoned. I know that even in those things, the gospel flourishes and spreads as a result of it. Um, what can separate us from the love of God? There is nothing, nothing that comes against us can separate us from God's love for us in Jesus Christ. Lord, I know and I've seen in stories, I've seen it in in, in, in our world today, but even in, in when the Bible was written in these various times, I've seen, uh, I've heard stories of people singing your praises and the chains fall off and the prison doors open up. I've seen people that have had a, a death sentence pronounced on them that the cancer is beyond anything a doctor could do. People began to speak God's word over their situation and miracles happen. Salvation is found in none other than Jesus Christ our Lord. And Lord, I know that it's not just for that person because as people would begin to share their testimony, other people believed. And the things that were brought against them from the enemy to try to harm them 
and tried to kill from kill them and destroy them and steal from them and all of these things turned out to be spoils of God's victory. Not only was that person received physical salvation, but other people believe and receive eternal life. So Lord, I thank you that when we see things that are bigger than us, that's a good place to be because we're not tempted to think we can do it any longer. We can then, at that point, receive your strength. We can receive uh, and meditate and fill our minds with what you have said. And take that sword of the Spirit. That's all we need. Because that's what destroys these battles that are in the spiritual world. Lord, I thank you for people that are tuning in right now that feel like, man, I'm at a point where I was ready to give up. I, I didn't have any hope for my tomorrow. I was dwelling too much in my past or was looking too far into my future. I wasn't living in the moment. When they begin to see and understand and speak God's Word, they're going to see victory today. They're going to receive God's grace today. His manna, His bread, His bread of life, which is Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank you for this Word. I thank you for Jonathan's faith on display. I thank you for the faith of believers around the world. We're going to see amazing things happen in these final days. All honor and glory and praise is yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right, if you would stand and uh, join us as to we continue to offer our grace filled messages every week. Sending. In the Old Testament, people would bring their sacrifice. The priest would look at it, and when the people would come in, they would hand their sacrifice over to the priest. And you know, during that time, the priest wasn't looking at the person who brought the sacrifice. The priest looked at the sacrifice. And today, that's the same thing. God doesn't look at us. He looks at the sacrifice. The perfect Lamb of God. If you have been blessed by today's message, you can help support our ministry by donating at acts433.com. Your donation is 100% tax deductible and will go towards sending the life-giving and life-transforming gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations.